based upon looking at the sutras, looking at the research, and seeing all of these contradictions that don't make sense. So thank you very much for your question. That was a very good question. Yes. So, so uh, you mentioned that the In your last lecture, one hour ago, you said concerning the same uh, history of uh, Venerable uh, Tikkun Dith. So you say that the religion's discrimination between from the, the ZM government and from the communism. So from my point of view, I see that there is a big difference because at the time when our Thich Quan Duc had, had uh, so uh, come a Bodhisattva after burning himself and so on, some of myself, I was at the demonstration at that time when I was very young, but I cannot approach him because uh, there, is, uh, there, was, uh, there were many policemen and so on. But my, I am thinking myself, why and how can we arrive at this situation, you know? And comparing the, discrimi mm -hmm. the discrimination from the communism, it's worse. And under the Mojinskian regime and government, we can change. We can change because it's not the like the communism who would like to erase the religious freedom. And after that, we have, after half a century, many documents who relate what happened at that time. And as, after that, the, 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 the truth can surface a little bit. But we ourselves, we all the Vietnamese people, we cannot judge how and uh, what happened at that time. And what Mrs. Yu, the, 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 the wife of uh, the brother of uh, um, President Yen. She said a very bad thing. We know that. But it's not from the history. We have to judge how they to the situation in Vietnam uh, back then, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, all of you know that history far, far better than I do, especially those, who, those of you who lived some of it, or all of it, um, which is, and partly there's very little uh, information about those monks that I was speaking, there's very little information on them in English that I was able to find. Uh, that's part of the reason why I kept it very general. Um, so I'm really not the best person to discuss 
the situation in Vietnam before the communists and after the communists. Uh, I felt a little funny when I started to give the talk and I saw us all of you sitting here, I'm like, why am I talking about this? <laughs> Uh, some of you were there. So, but Venerable, you know, most Venerable uh, Thich Lee asked me to mention the, these three months, and of course that was part of the history. So I really, uh, I really can't say anything more about that. Um, I can, however, uh, talk about um, those three kinds of faith. Actually, it was um, admiring faith, then yearning or longing faith, and then confident faith. Uh, what I said was that blind faith actually has no place uh, in the Dharma. Blind faith is, is uh, not knowing anything and just saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. It's kind of useless. If you don't understand the Buddha's teachings, you cannot make any progress. Um, if you don't have any access to the Buddha's teachings, say maybe because of Vietnam, the oppression that's happening now, uh, you know, in Vietnam. Maybe you're in a, a, a small village in the mountain and your temple has been shut down or something. The, the government got rid of the monks or whatever. I, I don't know. For whatever reason, if you don't have access to the Dharma, it's better to just chant Namo Yidapa, Namo Yidapa than to do nothing. Um, but the, the, the point is with these three kinds of faith, this, admi excuse me, this admiring faith, this admiring faith, that we begin with maybe, where we just kind of like the Buddha. The Buddha looks nice, and we heard a couple of things. Oh, Buddha's compassionate, okay, that's nice. What's good about that is if it leads us to uh, longing faith and then confident faith. If it ultimately leads us to confident faith, then this admiring faith, this very basic, uninformed, uneducated faith is good. Uh, but it's not good to stay there. We're going to, if we see some attraction to the Buddha, we should pursue it. We should pursue it. So that, that, was, that was actually my point. Thank you for your question. Thank you. They say that your vows are only truly pure the moment that you receive them. Every moment after that, your vows become more and more stained, more tarnished, more, not broken, but dented. They're only pure the moment that you take them. But because we cannot keep them perfectly, it doesn't mean we shouldn't take them at all. If we take vows, whether we're talking monastic vows or bodhisattva vows, um, we have established what we call that root of virtue. We planted that strong seed. So even if it doesn't bloom perfectly in this life, we planted a strong seed that will bear fruit later. See, everything that we think and say and do, it, it leaves an impression. Like, you know, you push your hand in the mud, in cement and it leaves that shape, right? So everything we think and say and do leaves an impression on the mind. And receiving monastic vows, receiving the bodhisattva vows, going for refuge, that leaves a really strong impression on the mind because it's, it's a big deal. So, uh, as I said though, it's something that we grow into over time. We can't expect ourselves to be perfect from day one. Uh, we're going to make mistakes. And sometimes it's an honest mistake that we didn't, we didn't know. Sometimes it's a stupid mistake 
We know better, but because of our ignorance, we do something wrong anyway. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't plant that seed, because it will eventually bear fruit. So, uh, and I think the way, generally speaking, the way to repair bodhisattva vows is to stop and say, oh, I've made a mistake, and to try and generate compassion, to remind ourselves why we've taken those vows, and just to recommit. In fact, you can receive the bodhisattva vows many times. Uh, you only do monastic ordination once. I mean, there's the novice ordination and then the bhikshu bhikshuni ordination, and that's what you have for life. In the next life, you take them again. But bodhisattva vows, we can take them again and again. We can recommit ourselves. So don't avoid taking the bodhisattva vows because you're afraid of mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I guarantee you the Buddha, in his previous lifetimes, he made mistakes, but he still became the Buddha. So don't worry. That was a good question too, thank you. So they're able to focus their minds, and then they start to contemplate things like um, emptiness, you know, aspects of wisdom and compassion, and they're able to uh, develop their minds uh, very clearly because they have the concentration first. Um, but if, you know, some people just find it boring sitting there focusing on their breath, and they want to do something a little more active. Well, then it's okay to go ahead and move into um, meditation on compassion. But there are all different kinds of ways to do that. As I said, um, uh, you can pick a specific individual. If you know someone in your life who is very ill or who's just having lots of problems and you just don't know what to do to help them, uh, then you can sit and uh, meditate. Uh, and you can picture either, like I said, you can breathe out light, health and wellness and well-being to them and then try to breathe in their suffering. Um, you could picture uh, Amitabha Buddha or um, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, Kwante Ambota, sort of hovering above them and light coming from that uh, Buddha and Bodhisattva to heal them and help them. Um, there are all different ways that you can do it. If you, if you think of some particular technique uh, that you like, as long as it's helping you to generate this compassion, then it's, then it's a good meditation. The important thing to understand, though, about this kind of meditation is that it's not magic. Uh, sometimes we miracles happen. Sometimes miracles do happen. I'm sure you've heard uh, plenty of Buddhist stories about uh, miraculous healing and, and miraculous events. But Buddhism, day-to-day -day Buddhism is not magic. The way that these meditations actually benefit other beings is that they help lead us to enlightenment. So if you're doing a meditation on compassion and you don't see the person that you're meditating on you know, suddenly, uh, miraculously being healed or all their problems go away, uh, well, we shouldn't give up on that meditation because the real point of that meditation isn't to change what's happening out here. It's to change